for the radio. We're happy to come into your presence again this afternoon. We're thanking you because that you decided to come along. That you can help us to pray the prayer of faith one more Sabbath afternoon and sing the songs of Zion as we trod on up Victory Hill. That we go on toward the land of Zion, go on toward the city of Zion, singing songs to the city. Praise God, knowing that the day is a coming when our toils and our trials will be over, when we won't be tempted anymore, when we can just revel in the presence of the Lord, when we can kneel down and thank Him again for what He's done for us, when we can just stand up and we can gaze at Him and smile, oh, when He has said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm looking forward to that day, and I believe that you can also say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. For God is still on the throne. He's still a good God. He's a loving God. Praise the Lord. You know, some people thought maybe that God couldn't smile, that he couldn't weep, but he couldn't love. He couldn't uh, do a lot of other things. But you know what? He did it through Jesus. He wept through the eyes of Jesus, and he smiled through the eyes and the lips of Jesus. He loved through the character of Jesus. God just showed us what he was if we looked at Jesus. Jesus was just a facsimile of God. You know, Jesus told one of the apostles, he says, Have you seen me this long, and you still ask me to see the Father? You ought to know what the Father's like, because Jesus himself was a facsimile of the Father. Years ago, when my sister Sylvia and I, Sister Sylvia Decker, you remember who used to play for me and plays out for the Healing Waters Temple now? We used to have to churn and churn and churn to get butter. And uh, that uh, when I was about eight years old, and when we'd get the butter, Mom would come and she'd gather it. And that was one of those up and down churns, you know, the, that, that dash of that old time. And Mom, she'd take the paddle and she'd get all that butter and put it together. And it'd just come up over the top of the, the butter dish. And she had two lids for it. And we could tell just exactly what lid that we put, uh, that she'd put on it. Because it had the imprint of that lid. And that, what, that butter is just the imprint of the lid that was put on it. And that was just exactly like Jesus is. He is a perfect facsimile of God the Father in heaven. He was just a, well, if the Father in heaven would say yes, Jesus would say yes. And there was no difference between them. Satan would have liked to have driven a, a wedge between them, between God and the Word of God back there in Ezekiel the 28th chapter and Isaiah the 14th chapter when he would have ascended into heaven and he would have there tried to say I'll be like unto the most high. Well, he would have tried to separate them within but he didn't get the job done. Thank God because there's nothing going to remain in heaven but perfection and that perfection is going to come because Jesus has covered us with his blood. That's what made us perfect was his blood. Now we can stand on his word, and we can resist the devil now by submitting ourselves to God and standing on the word, and the devil has to flee. Praise God if we can stand on his word. Those evil thoughts that would enamorate our life uh, and would just cause us to turn ourselves upside down. Uh, they've got to flee because we're standing upon the Word of God. The Spirit of God is nigh. He will help us to rightly divide the Word of truth. I'm a loving God yet today. Now in a few minutes, we're going to be looking at the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. Just in a very few minutes. And I imagine we'll start about the 10th verse. But in the meantime, I'd like to read a poem here about it, about Solomon. You know that's who we're going to be talking about. And here's what it said about Solomon when he first started. And 
Solomon his son became the king of Israel while yet young. He built the temple and his name unto the temple always clung. And Mount Monab it was built in grandeur was unsurpassed. Sometimes its walls of gold and gilt, the color of the rainbows packed. Now Hiram king of Tyre sent word that he had workmen skilled and neat. No sound of hammer should be heard until the building was complete. <clears throat> the stones were dressed in different lands. Each piece prepared its place to fill. And all were placed by skillful hands and everything around was still. The temple was of wondrous strength and it was everybody's pride. It was a hundred feet in length and thirty feet from side to side. The building stood three stories high, and at the east end rose a tower two hundred feet toward the sky, and emblems of its strength and power. For seven years the people toiled before the building was complete. Within the building the walls of serpent coiled, but for the present did retreat. Then Solomon a mansion built, for thirteen years he was employed, for it was trimmed with gold and gilt, and everything to be enjoyed. He had some ships that sailed the sea, and brought some gold, his wealth increased. He might have lived in perfect peace, were he from other cares released. But he must judge from right and wrong, between his subjects day by day, as they around his throne would strong to hear the words that he might say. Two women brought a child one day, and each one claimed it was her kid. Now Solomon sent right away to have a sword brought. Yes, he did. The people suffered as they toiled, and on their troubles did reflect. I uh, turned two pages, I'm sorry. And said he cut the child in twain, and let each mother have a part. At this one mother did complain, and from her eyes the tears did start. She pled with him to save the child, and said if he would let it live, that she herself was reconciled, and he to her the child might give. And then the other woman cried, as thou hast said, now let it be, Proceed at once, a child divide, give half to her and half to me. And then he said, I'll end the strife, and to the one the child will give, who most desires to save its life, and wish that I might let it live. For she is the mother of the child, the other woman is afraid. And all were pleased, and Mary, many smiled when this decision went abroad. His fame was scattered near and far. He spake of streams and rippling rills. He spoke of cedar trees that are around on Hebron's green hill. The hyssop which sprang from the wall. He spoke of the fowl as well as the beast. He spoke of the great things and the small. With him were not always the least. He wrote more than a thousand songs. Three thousand proverbs did he speak. He tried to rectify the wrongs and strengthen all whom he thought weak. He built great cities out of stone. He read the daughter of a king. He should have worshipped God alone, who to him did such honor bring. His fame had down to Sheba gone, reports of wealth and mansion grand. The queen then put on her trinkets on, and started to this far-off land, in which did dwell the mighty king, who showed to her great piles of gold. She said she thought the strangest thing was that one half had not been told. Now Solomon, as we are told, was not adverse to women's charm. No doubt his neck they did enfold, and clasped him in their lonely arms. For seven hundred wives he had with whom to dine and drink his wine. 
For fear that he might still be sad, he kept three hundred concubines. But after a while, when he grew old, the king against the true God's tribes, he still had plenty of his gold, but worshipped idols with his wives. And God with him became displeased, and said his kingdom he would take. His wrath became somewhat appeased, just on account of David's sake. I thought I'd throw that poem in because it'll help us out in just a few minutes. But God is still on the throne, and I want you now, if you will, we'll look at this piece of scripture, if you will, just for a minute. The tenth verse of the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is all so vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But whose riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. At this time, I'd like to have a song, if you will bear with me, on the piano, just a melody or two on the piano. Praise the God of love. If we can get God to sweep over our soul, praise the Lord, then we can be like Mary. We'll be sitting at his feet listening to the word of God, won't we? And that's what we want. We want to hear the word of God. God is still merciful. God is still good. And I don't know where we could find a better friend to you 
He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I'm a-thanking my God for that. Now, I want to look at that again. It said, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is all so vanity. As we look at the word vanity, we think of Solomon, the backslidden preacher. We think of an Ecclesiastes. We know that he was a good king for quite a while. We realize that. And that he had ruled with David for a while. And he took over when David passed on into eternity to be with his creator. And we, we know that also. And we look at the Proverbs and we see how the wisdom of Solomon did flourish. But as we look at Ecclesiastes, we think of the backslidden preacher all as vanity. For it said, I think, in about the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, in the first verse, it's either the 11th or the 10th chapter, it says, And King Solomon lived, loved many strange women. And he took women from other other uh, nationalities also. They were, the Jews were not supposed to intermarry with other nationalities, but King Solomon took that privilege to himself. And consequently, as the Lord becomes so engrossed in his anger at Solomon that he swore by Ahijah the prophet, he said, I'm going to divide it. I'm going to take ten tribes away from Solomon. And I guess when Rehoboam become king, that he only had two tribes left with him. It called a division in God's people, and that was a sore strait to, to think of it, because in that northern kingdom where Jeroboam become the king, the son of Nebat, he become king, and it seems as though that the whole uh, plan was wrong. The whole plan had backfired uh, for God's people uh, because they were supposed to enjoy Canaan's land, uh, and now they weren't doing it. Uh, they were fighting against each other. And so here we see that what Solomon uh, in that time, uh, in his later life, uh, when he was getting estranged from God uh, and going astray uh, before he come, oh yes, I believe he come back to God because uh, uh, Jesus spoke of the lilies and compared to Solomon, and I don't believe that if Solomon had died um, an evil death, uh, I'd, a lost man's death, a lost soul's death, I don't believe uh, that God would have referred to him. Uh, yes, I believe he come back to the Lord uh, as far as that's concerned, but at the same time, look at the years that he lost, uh, and look what it caused uh, to the land of God's people, to those Canaan, uh, those in Canaan there. Canaan's land should have belonged to God's people, and they should have been a united people. And you know what happens today uh, in your denominations when they divide. Uh, when they divide, and they have time to fight each other then instead of throwing their arms around each other and loving one another and having the power of God and the love of God shed abroad in their life. Uh, oh, listen, that's what happened to Solomon when he backslid. And that's what he could see. He could see the downward road. Uh, he said, all is vanity. He couldn't see the love of God like he had seen at once before. It was a different type altogether now. His, his aspects of, of the an outlook on life was altogether different than what it used to be because all he could see now was vanity of uh, vanity. All is vanity. And that's what he's talking about, the silver. He that wants more silver, and he gets more silver, and I'll throw in gold also, and he who gets all that. Now, oh, yes, I don't think that I don't have a desire for it, because I have a desire for, for uh, finances. I wish that I had more than what I have, uh, because it seems as though that I can't make uh, any uh, ends meet. Uh, it just seems that way. But God always, it seems as though that just as I have to have something, God has laid it on somebody's heart uh, to send in an offering that we can use. Uh, and God is so good on that. Uh, he has been a, a wonderful God. And that's why I ask you people to keep praying. As you keep praying, then God can put it on somebody's heart uh, that, has, uh, that has been blessed by the heavens above uh, to send in an offering that we can move on with the Lord. Uh, and he keeps us on the air, and he keeps 
Adventists and the church up there at Wolferville, both. Uh, he does both for us, uh, and God is still good. Uh, we don't have to worship silver, even though uh, I say, yes, I could use a little more of it. Uh, I don't uh, have anything against it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a talking about that. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a talking about laziness. I don't uh, want somebody to be lazy and say I don't need it. Uh, this is just a cure uh, for that anxiety, a cure for that nervousness uh, that comes upon us uh, and wants us to move from day to day for more finances. Uh, oh, listen, that can cause us a lot of trouble when we're looking for that finances uh, and uh, we don't get it. Uh, he even spoke of it over there in Daniel in the days of I think it was Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar one that was gathered and honoring the gods of gold and silver. No, don't let us get there. Don't let us make gold and silver. Don't let us make currency and finances our God. Don't let us do that. But let us say, God, you supply our riches according to your riches in glory. Supply our needs. Yes, our needs. And if you want to say so, riches. Yes, it's riches to see God, how he can do it for us, to supply our needs according to his riches in glory. It said, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, save in the beholding of them with their eyes? Uh, oh, yes, uh, there's room for satisfaction. And um, yes, with what God can give to us, uh, there's going to be room for satisfaction there, and God will give us that. And what is left over, uh, uh, that's what we're looking at, uh, that maybe we're making so much every payday that we don't have to worry, uh, that we can just put a great uh, a part of it in the bank, uh, or that we can hide it uh, in a sack if we don't want to pay income tax on it, uh, that we can hide it in a sack and put it somewhere. Uh, I heard my father-in-law talk years ago about a man who had his hid in a sack, and that was something, if you go back a hundred years, to find someone that had enough finances to hide in a sack uh, and to hide it away. And he went and he counted every day, uh, and so somebody saw him do it. Uh, well, when he left, uh, they, they got the finances and left. Uh, and then they looked, uh, come back and they found him a looking and a crying and said, what was he crying about? Well, he had a lot of money buried there and somebody's got it. I well, said, what was you doing with it? Well, he said, I'd just like to count it every day. Well, he said, it wasn't doing you any good. Let it do somebody else some good. Uh, uh, of course, we realize that that's not right, that that also is vanity. Uh, and let us realize that God will supply our need, that we don't have to take it from somebody else. Uh, and if we're not uh, looking at the finances to a great extent, uh, and a depression comes, uh, it's just a little inconvenience to you. <coughs> it's not a, <coughs> it's not a complete uh, calamity. It's a little convenient inconvenience to us when the depression comes. Uh, I realize if it gets bad enough that we can't put a loaf of bread on the, the table for our children, that that is that is a a, a calamity. I know that, uh, and that is a real depression, but. Uh, that usually doesn't happen that way here. Since the major depression in the 30s does it, uh, that we can very near have a loaf of bread to feed. We may not have good furniture. We may not be able to pay the rent. And we may not have the fuel, uh, but uh, I know that God's people will still trust him for what that he wants them to have. Uh, and I look at the next verse there. Uh, it says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Um, no matter how much that that uh, poor man has, that laboring man has it at the end of the week uh, when he gets his pay, whether it's a small check or whether it's a big check, where he can eat big or where he has to eat little, where he eats hamburger or where he eats T-bone steak. Um, I know when I used to work at the brass mill, I thought that I had a hamburger income and a T-bone appetite. Uh, that's the way that I felt. Uh, but I know that that's not uh, God's way. God wants me to be satisfied with what he has given to me. I don't know how many of you feel the same way, uh, that God wants you to be satisfied with what that you have. And God is going to bless you if you just praise him for what he has given you. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, and you know, and they don't forget God. Uh, and that sleep 
is uh, is just sweet to that man. It's real sweet to him uh, to know uh, that God has given him good sleep uh, and uh, he can sleep at the end of a hard day's work. Uh, and God says, well done in your soul for because you have not uh, cheated your employer. Uh, and God wants you to have good sleep and you can have it. Uh, but I don't think that that man uh, who is uh, looking for a little more um finances all the time i don't think uh, and uh, that he's going to get good sleep uh, i think he'll probably be like the rich man over there in luke's new testament phrase where god g- uh, jesus gave them a parable uh, there of uh, the rich man who was going to tear down his barn i believe that that had been an actual fact and maybe there has been some actual facts like that later on i believe that that man for the month before he starts tearing down his barn to build new ones uh, i believe he's a rolling and a tossing all night uh, trying to figure out new ways uh, of building that barn that'll hold a little bit more that'll be a little bit stronger and it will last a little bit longer i believe that uh, uh, that rich man would be that way that his sleep wasn't too good how is your sleep can you sleep at night or has god let uh, you know that there's something stands between you and god if there is dear one make it right Make it right with God, and if it has to be, make it right with a fellow man also. Oh, the fruit of a hard day's work is sound sleep, and you get it. The rich man, the barn builder, his wasn't so much uh, that way. The worship not the gifts, dear one, but worship the giver, the one who gives those gifts to you, the one who gives you eternal life, uh, the one who gives you breath and strength to make a living for yourself uh, in the natural. Praise his holy name. Praise him and l- don't be a holding back anything from him that belongs to him, but give to him. You know, it says the next one there. He says, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to the hurt. And I just wonder if that one who makes a dollar, if he spends a hundred cents of it, or does he give 10 cents into his church offering. I'm t- uh, preaching tithes now. I can preach it on the radio because tithes don't necessarily go to the radio evangelist. Tithes go to your church uh, where you attend church Sunday morning. That's where the tithes belong. Uh, but uh, Oh, yes, I offering. That's right. I'll accept them any time that uh, you feel like that God has led you. That's true. But that idea it can be to your hurt, dear one, if you don't give God that which belongs to him. I'm a saying giving the tithes, no, paying the tithes, because actually 10% of what you make belongs to God. And can you do it? Don't keep it to your hurt. Malachi said when the Jews was having a hard time, he said, if you would just bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse, he said, and prove me. He said, I'll give you a blessing that you can't contain. And friends, I believe I'm talking to some who can stand a bigger blessing than what they've had. Are you paying your tithe are you giving to God listen not only money but are you giving to him in his time to and reading and in praying reading the scriptures and praying to God at night or in the morning or both are you doing that father in heaven we're thankful again God that we've had the privilege of bringing this message forth in song and in word God that you can have your way Lord cause us to realize that there's more in this life than just finances. God, it's not only gold and silver and bonds and what we have in the bank and the credit union and so on like that, but God, it's what we have in our heart that that we can turn loose to our fellow man and bolster them in times of their need when the depression of some type hits their heart. Father, we ask you to give us uh, that power and that soothing sensation that we can see souls saved and lives filled with your spirit in the sweet and lovable name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen and amen. And until this time next Sabbath afternoon, this is the Evangelist Gordon Williams returning you to your announcer.